miles away. It was it got away from me. Hello, my Bill for Thousand Nation. How's everyone doing today? Hopefully everyone's having a great day. If not, I hope it gets better from here. We're back with a new Mr. Bowling video. That's right. This one is titled He Was Playing a Deadly Game. Places you can't go, but people did anyways. Part 37. Alright. I'm excited again this story. I love the three parter ones. Oh. I don't know why I love the three-parter one so much, but I really do. You get three stories in one, and it's like, what, 30-some minutes long? That's amazing. Like, each story is around 10 minutes. I, that, that's my jam. I have ADHD. That's about as long as my attention goes before I start just like... <laughs> you know, you've seen me. Don't judge me. Judge me. I don't care. It's fine. All right, I'm excited for today's story. If you guys are excited as I am, please go ahead, turn them lights down low, put on something comfy, cup or something special. Let's get intrigued. Three times. Today, we're going to look at three places you can't go and people, people who went did, there anyways. anyways. But before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, the next time the like button says they need to replace their tires on their Toyota Corolla, offer to do it for them and to pay for them, but make sure you replace their tires with enormous oversized monster truck tires. Also, please subscribe to our channel. I would have no problem with that, Mr. Ballin. That would that that that's doing the like button like a favor, homie. So are we being nice to the like button now? <laughs> and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's stories. Oh, I'm so excited. The pilot. Oh shit, this one's in a plane? I have a question before we get into it. Now, whenever it says places and people shouldn't go, was he taking people someplace they shouldn't go, or was he taking himself? Because it, it's a whole there, there, do, 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 do. <laughs> this, this one could be worse than what we're thinking if he took a bunch of people with him. That's all I'm saying, okay? On the evening of March 22nd, 1994, a 40-year-old, very experienced airline pilot named Andrei Danilov walked into the cockpit of a huge airplane that he was about to fly out of Moscow. Once he was in the cockpit, he said hello to the two other pilots he'd be flying with that night, and then Andrei took a seat in the captain's chair. Now, this flight tonight was going to be a very routine 13-hour trip to Hong Kong, something Andrei and these other two pilots had done many times before. But this night, Andre was totally dreading this trip because one of the pilots he'd be flying with that night was a guy that Andre just could not stand. His name was Yaroslav Kudrinsky, and he was going to be the relief pilot that night. So Andre is the captain and the primary pilot. He has a co-pilot or first officer who sits right next to him. And then behind those two would be Yaroslav, the relief pilot, who basically is just there in case the captain Emergency. or first officer needed a break. And so basically Andre was going to be forced to interact with Yaroslav all night long. And so as passengers made their way onto the plane, and as Andre went through his pre-check procedures to get ready for this flight, Yaroslav just started yapping away about how amazing he was and what a great dad he was because he brought his kids on this flight. You know, they hadn't done a big international flight before, and so he was letting them fly with him that night. And then also Yaroslav began talking about this big surprise he had for his kids that was really going to show what an incredible father he really was. Now, Andre and the first officer were listening to Yaroslav, but they were basically just completely ignoring him. They're not responding to him. They're not feeding into what he's saying. But Yaroslav didn't care. He just kept on rambling on and on and on about how amazing he was. And so finally, Andre got clearance to take off. 
And so even though Yaroslav was totally annoying him, he was able to take off and they went up to their cruising altitude and they began making their way towards Hong Kong. And the whole time, you know, Yaroslav's just going on and on and on. And finally, five hours into this trip, Yaroslav is still just going on and on and on. And Andre has just had it. He cannot stand to be around this guy anymore. And so finally, Andre turned around and just cut off Yaroslav, who was mid-sentence about some anecdote about how strong his son was and what a talented wrestler he was. And so Andre just cuts him off and is like, Yaroslav, take over. I'm taking a break. I'm going to go sleep for a bit. And so Yaroslav would stop what he was doing. He would stand up. He would take his seat in the captain's chair and he would take over flying the plane. And so Andre got up. He left the cockpit. He went to the very back of the plane in the main cabin to this row of seats that was reserved for him and the other pilots. And he got in there and he laid down and he closed his eyes. But just a couple okay. of minutes after closing his eyes, Andre began to feel the plane begin to bank hard to one side. Now, Andre couldn't really remember if this was the time they were supposed to be turning or not, but it just felt like this turn was more aggressive than anything he anticipated at any point in this journey. But Andre knew this plane was brand new, and so if there were any kind of minor mistakes that Yaroslav was making flying the plane, well, the autopilot feature, which was state-of-the-art in this plane, would yeah. easily correct those small errors and oh, keep God. the plane going towards its destination. And so, even though, again, there's a still bad in this pretty sharp turn here... Anyone else think that Yaroslav did something just he really, really shouldn't have because he thinks he's more awesome than what he is? Did the motherfucker go big or go home and forgot where his home was? Andre just closed his eyes again and tried to go to sleep. But a couple of minutes later, they were still banking. And in fact, the bank was starting to get even more aggressive to the point where Andre opened his eyes and he's thinking to himself, what is Yaroslav doing up there? Like we're basically going in a circle at this point. We're spiraling midair. And so right as Andre was about to get up and go see what the heck was going on, the plane began to shake really violently. And suddenly Andre realized, oh my goodness, the plane could be stalling right now. There could be a real issue in the cockpit. And this is not some minor error. And so as passengers on the plane are starting to sense that something could be wrong here, I mean, the plane is like hard to the side and shaking. So people are starting to scream and cry. People are nervous. And so Andre, he begins to stand up to go to the cockpit when suddenly the plane goes from just shaking and banking to basically rolling completely on its side. So all the windows are now on the ground and everybody's on their side. Andre knew he could not go to the cockpit. There was no way to do that. And so all he could do was just hold on to his seat and pray they got out of this. And then just as quickly as all this started, it stopped. The plane kind of went back to level, it stopped shaking. And then Andre heard the sound of the twin engines out on the wings roar as if the plane was kind of getting back up to speed. And for a second, it seemed like everything was okay. And so Andre, sensing that this was his chance to get back to the cockpit and frankly just reassume command because whatever was going on in there, it was not okay. And so Andre, he got up and began running down the aisle to get to the cockpit. But right as he was about to grab the door, the plane suddenly tilted upward and they began rocketing up into the sky. So strong that Andre was pinned to the carpet. And so for a couple of seconds, Andre couldn't do anything. But then he began to hear the sound of the actual frame of the plane beginning to crack from all the pressure of accelerating so quickly up into the sky. And so with all of his strength, Andre reached up, you know, he's on his hands and knees and he grabs the door handle to the cockpit and he opens it up. And the second he looks into the cockpit, he would have known exactly what was wrong. It would turn out Yaroslav's big surprise for his kids that he promised Andre and the first officer would demonstrate what an amazing father he was, was that he was gonna let his kids fly the plane just for a second, but these are untrained children that have no idea how to fly a plane. And so when Andre got up and went to go take a nap and Yaroslav took over, well, Yaroslav called up his kids who were in the main cabin, a teenage son and daughter, and they went into the cockpit and they sat down in the captain's chair and they began to fly the plane. And the daughter took the seat first in the captain's chair and she was very careful not to touch any of the controls. Even though Yaroslav was kind of encouraging her, you know, to take the wheel and really see what it feels like. But she was nervous and so she really didn't touch anything. 
Smart. And Yaroslav's son, when he sat down in the captain's chair, he did grab the controls and he pulled on the wheel hard enough that he somehow disengaged the autopilot feature and nobody noticed. And so as Yaroslav's son is yanking forward and backwards on the yoke, so the steering wheel of the plane, the plane began going in all these crazy directions because there was no autopilot to stop it. And by the time he had figured out what was wrong, it was too late because the plane had entered into an unrecoverable stall and it crashed into the foothills of Siberia, killing all 75 people on board. Fucking idiot. Thank you to how the fuck you gonna let your fucking kid fly a fucking plane? It is one thing putting your child on your lap and p having him steer the car while you're pushing the pedals. You don't let a dumbass teenager fly a fucking plane with people, people, family, people who have fucking loved ones. Because you want to be an amazing fucking dad. Someone's not going to get to see their fucking dad. Some dad's not going to be able to see his wife, his kids. Family's fucking ruined. Because you're a fucking shit. That angers me. Oh my god. Feel my face getting hot. <laughs> Was that your plan to be an annoying fuck the whole time until the pilot's just like, I can't handle it no more? And you was going to get your fucking way? I hope that motherfucker literally has a book written about him about how fucking stupid he is. Better help for sponsoring today's video. Back in 2018, I need some better help now, Mr. Ballin. Thank you. Thank you. I was very depressed. I had just left the military and I was really struggling to reassimilate back into civilian society and it was making me depressed. And even though I was encouraged from a young age to open up and talk about my feelings when I was feeling down, you know, as an adult, I just couldn't do it. I felt very insecure about it and was worried if I began talking about my problems that I would be viewed as kind of a weak person or even worse, a complainer, something I was very worried about. But eventually I would go seek out a therapist because I became so miserable and it just had to happen. And I'm so glad I did because as soon as I actually talked to a real therapist, I saw therapy is actually kind of great. As soon as you open up and kind of unburden yourself, a trained therapist can really help you work through your issues and come to terms with them. And over time, you'll get better. And so that's why today I wanna to talk to you about BetterHelp. BetterHelp is a highly reviewed online therapy platform, which means you can get the help you need right from the comfort of your own home. And then after filling out a brief survey online, BetterHelp will usually be able to match you with one of their licensed therapists within 24 hours. And then it's up to you how you communicate with your therapist. You can chat with your therapist on your phone, your computer, you know, phone call, video call, messaging. It's totally up to you. So if you're struggling right now and you think therapy could help you too, think about giving BetterHelp a try. Let BetterHelp connect you with a therapist who can support you right from the comfort of your own home. Visit betterhelp.com slash Mr. Ballin, or just click Mr. Ballin during sign up to enjoy a special discount on your first month. Hells yeah. On the morning of September 19th, 2013, a man named Mark Casey sat with his girlfriend, Lynn Spaulding, in the triage area of the emergency room at San Francisco General Hospital. A nurse took Lynn's temperature and her blood pressure while Mark tried to explain what had been going on with Lynn over the past few weeks. Lynn, who was now 57, had been dealing with this really intense stomach pain. And so she had gone to the doctor and she had been diagnosed with a urinary tract infection and she was given antibiotics gotcha, for gotcha. it. But despite taking those antibiotics, it didn't get rid of the stomach pain. And in fact, her stomach pain was only getting worse. She was losing weight and she just seemed really frail. But despite her condition obviously getting worse every single day, 
over the past few weeks, Lynn had basically refused to go back to the hospital, despite Mark saying, we really got to go. You're getting worse. We got to have you looked at. But she just kept saying no. And then finally, when Mark noticed Lynn was now becoming somewhat despondent, like he would try to talk to her and her eyes would glaze over and she would look off into the distance like she didn't Aww. even hear him. Mark had just looked at Lynn and said, you know what? I'm taking you to the hospital. And so he put her in the car, he brought her to the hospital. And now that he was here, he had to explain what was going on because Lynn was still despondent, just kind of staring off into space and very likely having no idea what was going on. And so after Mark gave all the information to the nurse, the nurse said that, okay, that. you know, Lynn needs to be admitted to the hospital. And so after a short wait, an orderly came over and pushed Lynn's wheelchair up to the fifth floor where she'd be staying. And Mark went with them. And then once in the room, Mark helped Lynn get settled in her bed. And again, Lynn is just kind of staring off into space, not really paying attention. And then a whole team of nurses and doctors came in and hooked Lynn up to IVs and different machines to make sure they could monitor her. And then at some point, one of the doctors pulled Mark aside and said, you know, we think Lynn is dealing with some kind of infection and so what we need to do is run some tests to figure out what this infection is and then hopefully we can treat it oh, and so yeah. mark said okay that sounds great and then all day mark sat right next to lynn and held her hand as the medical team came in and out of the room running all these tests the following day the medical team still didn't know what was wrong with lynn the tests they had run so far were inconclusive or were negative now the biggest issue with lynn was not trying to figure out what infection she had or how to cure her Instead, it was, how do we keep Lynn in her hospital room? Because on this second day that Lynn was at the hospital, despite being very despondent still, any chance she got, she was getting out of her bed and trying to escape her room. And so the medical team, they kept having to go find her and bring her back to her room. And they tried to explain to her, like, Lynn, you're sick. That's why you're here. You need to stay in your room. But Lynn clearly was just not getting it. She was yeah. just not there. And she would just say to the team, I want to go home. I just want to go home. I want to go home. Beautiful lady. Would say, Beautiful well, Lynn, lady. You've got to get better first, and then you can go home. Now, Mark, like the medical staff, was also concerned about Lynn's behavior. It was not safe for her to get up and flee her hospital room. But Mark kind of secretly thought, you know, maybe this is a good sign because the day before, Lynn couldn't even walk on her own. And now today, she's walking around on her own trying to escape the hospital, which is bad. But, you know, she's ambulatory. That's going to be a good sign. Glass half full, glass half empty situation. I, I've been with him. Glass half full. Lee, she walking, bro. I love it. And also, Mark was thinking that because Lynn was fleeing her room over and over again, <laughs> she's going to get even better medical care because the staff has to be super focused on her. And so Mark was feeling kind of optimistic that Lynn was on the road to recovery. The next yes, morning, so now Lynn has been at the hospital for two days at this point, a nurse went into Lynn's room to check on her at about 10.15 a.m., and she walked up to Lynn, who was in her bed, and Lynn immediately told the nurse that she wanted to go home, and the nurse said, sorry, Lynn, we still don't know what's wrong with you. You gotta stay here for now. But again, it was pretty clear Lynn did not understand what the nurse was saying. And so Lynn was oh. not agitated. She was laying in bed and did not appear to, you know, want to flee the room anytime soon. And so the nurse took Lynn's vitals. They were all basically normal. And then the nurse wrote down on Lynn's chart that her condition as of this moment was fair. And then the nurse left the room. And once this nurse was gone, Lynn laid in bed for a second. And then when nobody else came in the room, she sat up, she hopped off the bed, and she took off her hospital gown. She pulled out all the cords and wires that were on her. Then she put on her jeans, her boots, her jacket. She grabbed her purse off the table, and she walked out the door. And the second she walked out the door, she would have been in this long hallway, except her room was at the end of the hallway. So when she stepped out into that hallway, if she turned right, she would have seen a long, long stretch of hallway with other hospital rooms and lots of staff and doctors and nurses kind of walking around. But to her left, it would have been a dead end with a single blue door with a green exit sign over the top of it. And so Lynn, she steps into the hallway, she looks down the long side to the right, then she looks to the left, she sees the blue door, and she goes to the blue door, she opens it up, and she disappears inside. When the nurse came back to Lynn's room and saw she wasn't there, 
she reported Lynn missing. Now, remember, the hospital was well aware of the fact that Lynn had been trying to escape for the past 48 hours, and so nobody was really shocked by this. In fact, the hospital, their first move was to contact Mark, who had actually gone home the night before to get some real sleep and to take a shower. And so they contacted Mark and they said, hey, Lynn's not here, is she with you? And Mark was like, no, I'm home, she's not here. I have not seen her, I haven't talked to her, I have no idea where she is. And so the hospital at this point began this huge search in their building, just checking the entire property for Lynn but there was no trace of her. And so the police were contacted and they launched a search both of the hospital grounds and also of the surrounding areas. And they too could not find a trace of Lynn. It Nobody was like decided Lynn to go into the, through the into blue thin door. Air. That is until October 8th, 2013. So 17 days after Lynn had strolled through that blue exit door. On that day, October 8th, a hospital maintenance worker was walking down the long hallway in the hospital, not on the fifth floor where Lynn was staying, but one floor below, so on the fourth floor. And he's walking down this long hallway in the direction of the dead end side, so the same side that Lynn was on where her room was, but again, one floor above. And the maintenance worker, he walks all the way to the end of this hallway on the fourth floor, and he arrives in front of the blue door with the green exit sign above it. Again, this is below where Lynn was, but it looks the same. And the maintenance worker, he opened up the door, and when he looked out of the fourth floor door, he just froze, because what he was looking at just seemed impossible. And then he had this urge to scream, but he knew there were all these patients and kids and doctors and stuff in the hallway behind him, and he didn't want to scare anyone. And so very quietly, he reached down and grabbed his radio, and he called for help. In order to explain what happened next, you need to look at this picture. So in this picture on the right hand side, you see there are two outdoor landings with people on them. The one on top is the fifth floor landing and the oh, one below no. it with a single person on it is the fourth floor landing. And to get onto these outdoor landings, you have to walk through those blue exit doors at the end of those hallways. These blue doors are emergency exits. And so when you go out these blue doors, once they shut, they lock automatically. Yeah. But now you're out on this outdoor landing and immediately to your right, although you can't see it in this picture, there is actually another door that leads to this enclosed stairwell that will bring you all the way to the ground floor where there's another door that's unlocked that will bring you out to safety. And so again, okay. you walk out one of those blue doors, you're on this landing, you can turn, open up another door, you're in the stairwell, and you can evacuate. So in theory, if you were a person that really wanted to escape this hospital, like Lynn did, going out one of these blue door emergency exits Good was idea. a great idea. Oh, it yeah. would bring you to the ground. This is a way to escape the hospital. But remember, Lynn was totally confused. Mentally, she was just not there because of whatever illness was affecting her. And so when she walked out that door, she arrived on the fifth floor landing and the door shut behind her and it locked. And the theory is, as soon as Lynn got out there, maybe she had some second thoughts and wanted to go back into the hospital. And so she turned and she grabbed that door and tried to open it back up again. But because it locks automatically, it wouldn't open. And so Lynn did have the wherewithal to turn and see this other door that led to this enclosed stairwell, the emergency stairwell that did go to the ground floor. She could absolutely go all the way down and escape. She could do that. She went into the stairwell and she went down one floor to the fourth floor landing. And when she got there, she left the stairwell and she went to that door that would lead back into the hospital on the fourth floor. And she tried it, but of course it was locked. Yeah. And then again, instead of her just going back into the stairwell and going down and escaping to safety, she, for some reason, just stayed on the fourth floor landing. Again, you gotta remember that she's not all there mentally. And so she was confused and she just stayed there on the landing, basically waiting to be rescued. But despite these huge searches of the hospital property by hospital staff and by the police, for some reason, this area, this landing on the fourth floor was never, was never checked. Up. And so nobody found her. That is until- The door right next to her fucking door wasn't fucking checked. That's fucking stupid. Oh, I would be beating the shit off so many people. Oh my God. Should've been place number one, bruh.
till October 4th. So at this point, Lynn has been outside for 13 days on this landing and a researcher from the hospital, for whatever reason, exited out one of these emergency doors and they began making their way downstairs. And when they passed by the fourth floor landing, they spotted Lynn on the ground on the fourth floor landing. But instead of going over to her and seeing if she was okay, this researcher just called security and said, hey, there's a patient outside on the fourth floor landing, like come check it out. And then instead of waiting for security, the researcher just left, leaving Lynn alone and security at the hospital who said they were gonna go check, they didn't. And so four more days would go by with still nobody officially finding Lynn. And then finally on October 8th, the hospital maintenance worker opened up the blue door on the fourth floor Found and he saw body. the fourth floor landing, that exterior landing and he saw Lynn and he knew she was dead. Officials were never able to determine when Lynn died, so it's not clear how long she was alive out on that landing. But it is possible she could have been alive when that researcher found her, but obviously help didn't come in time. Ultimately, Lynn's family would sue the city and the hospital and they would be awarded $3 million. So a lot of money, but still not enough for a whole life. I don't give a fuck how much it is. On May 28th, 1986, a Florida real estate agent named Marguerite Welty walked up to the front door of this little white stucco home sitting right on the edge of Lake Placid in Florida. Marguerite pulled out a key from her pocket, she unlocked the door, opened it up, and then she turned around and standing right in front of her were her clients, this young couple named Lois and Richard Goodman, who were thinking about buying a vacation home. And so this was one of the homes they were checking out. And so Marguerite smiled at her clients and gestured for them to come inside. The house sat at the end of a quiet, shady street lined with huge trees and other small vacation homes. And a lot of these vacation nice. homes were perfectly manicured and beautiful, but the house they were it's touring today nice. was not. It was unmaintained and overgrown. You know, the paint was chipped and fading. It just looked bad because the owner of this property at one time had used this house as their vacation home, but lately they had just kind of stopped coming out here. And so they really never came out to check on the property. And so it definitely had the look of an abandoned property. And now the owner didn't even know if they could fix it anymore. And so they decided they would just sell it and let somebody else deal with it. And so Marguerite led Richard and Lois into the house and she brought them right into the carpeted living room. And the house was very musky and dark. You know, all the windows were shut and all the blinds were drawn. And so Marguerite kind of instinctively walked over to the windows and began opening up the curtains and opening up the blinds, letting sunlight into the house. And so as this room okay. is suddenly being lit up by the sunlight, Behind her, Marguerite hears Lois and Richard start to laugh at something. And so Marguerite turned around to see what was so funny. And when she saw what Lois and Richard were laughing at, Marguerite did not think it was very funny. In fact, she thought the fact that they were laughing right now was kind of rude, especially when you considered what this couple had asked of Marguerite. They had come to Marguerite and said, hey, we wanna buy a vacation home. It needs to be perfect. It needs to be on the water. It needs to have this and this and this but we have a tiny budget, go find us homes. And so Marguerite had really struggled to find vacation homes that were in their budget, but then she had found this right. diamond in the rough, this house on the coast of Lake Placid. It had three bedrooms, two bathrooms, it had a garage, direct access to the water. It even had a boat dock. I mean, this house was perfect. Now, of course, this house had obvious downsides, like the fact that it was clearly a fixer-upper. I mean, anybody who bought this home would have to put a lot of work into just making it livable again. And then also there was a distinct weird vibe about the property itself. Because the owner was never there, they had covered all the furniture inside of this home with white sheets, which kind of gave it a sort of haunted house vibe. And then also there was virtually nothing of value inside of this home because again, the owner was like never here. But for some reason, there was this super intense security system on the house. I mean, there was cameras everywhere and the windows had metal bars over them. And so the aesthetic inside and outside this house was not a good one. But again, you know, Marguerite felt like if they could just look past the negative stuff, 
this was really the perfect place for them. Oh, but yeah. now, here Marguerite's clients were, laughing away at the kind of goofy interior of this home. It's like they were being totally disrespectful both to Marguerite and, frankly, to the owner of this property. I mean, this is a good opportunity. What are you doing? But ultimately, Marguerite couldn't force her clients to be appreciative of this. And so she just kind of laughed along with them, but then very quickly changed the subject and told them, you know, hey, let's go walk around the rest of the house. Make sure you see the whole place before you pass judgment. But Marguerite only had to lead Richard and Lois around the house for a couple more minutes to figure out they definitely were not in the market for this house. They could not look past the bizarre kind of spooky almost atmosphere inside the house and how run down it was. You know, so they were just not going to put an offer on this house and Marguerite knew it. And so even though Marguerite was definitely frustrated, she told her clients, you know, don't worry about it. I'll go back to the drawing board. I'll find more properties and we'll check those out. And so Marguerite led Richard and Lois out of the property. She shut and locked the door behind her. And then she and her clients left. Two days later, on May 30th, 1986, the owner of this rundown old vacation home came by to check on the property. Basically because they were trying to sell it, they just wanted to go up and make sure there were no obviously bad things about the property. They knew it was in rough shape, but you know, they're just doing a sanity check. And so they get to this property, yeah. they open up the door and they step inside and right away the owner is hit with this horrible smell. Now the owner knew it normally did not smell great inside this home, but this smell he was smelling now was just so bad. It was so pungent. He knew it was not normal. And so the owner began walking around the house trying to figure out where the smell was coming from. And at some Someone point he found that. himself in the living room and his eyes happened to land on the thing that Richard and Lois Goodman had been laughing at two days earlier. Except when the owner saw this thing, he didn't think it was funny at all. In fact, what he did is he instantly turned around, ran out of the house, grabbed a phone, and called 911. Four days earlier, on May 26th, a 28-year-old man named Thomas Lopez Ruiz, who was living in this makeshift campsite down by the water near Lake Placid, he decided to leave his campsite and go into town to try to earn some money. Thomas did not have a steady job. Instead, he did odd jobs in town whenever he could to earn a few bucks. But on this day, when Thomas went into town, there was no work. Damn. So Thomas decided he would go rob one of the many vacation homes along the coastline of Lake Placid. And the home that he picked is the same vacation home that Marguerite would take the Goodmans to two days later. And so Thomas arrives in front of this overgrown property and he tries the doors and they're all locked. However, Thomas had a plan. Thomas was a pretty small guy. He was about five foot two inches tall, only weighed about 140 pounds. And so he figured he could just slip through the chimney. That's how he could break into the house. And at first it went great. You know, he slipped in no problem. And before long, he was making his way down towards the inside of the house. Yeah. But what Thomas realized as he went down the chimney is the chimney was not perfectly straight up and down. Instead, it was sort of tapered where at the top it was wide, but the deeper you got, so the farther down you went in the chimney, the narrower the inside of the chimney got. And so when Thomas was almost all the way down the chimney, he got stuck. He could not get the rest of the way down. Oh, shit. But where he got stuck, he couldn't grab the top of the chimney. He oh, couldn't pull shit. himself out. And so he is absolutely wedged, can't go down, can't go up, and making matters even worse was every time he exhaled, his chest would shrink a little bit, and that would cause him to slip a little bit farther, a little bit deeper into the chimney. And then when he would try to breathe in again, his chest would not be able to fully expand again. And so basically, every second oh, that went man. by, Thomas was sinking lower and lower and lower by little bits, making it harder and harder and harder to breathe. And you got to figure that he was screaming for help, which again was causing him to breathe a bunch, causing him to sink even farther. And so it would have made breathing extremely difficult. And so Thomas is like in this absolute claustrophobic nightmare. And without outside help, he had no chance of survival. Two days later, Marguerite Welty brought the Goodmans into that property and she would open up the blinds and sunlight would come into the living room and Marguerite would hear Lois and Richard laughing at something and she would turn around and she would see they were pointing at the fireplace and visible in this fireplace were two legs dangling down inside the chimney. They were not so far down that they were touching the ground. They were just kind of suspended in the air. 
and Lois and Richard based on the way the house looked already. You know, the kind of spooky vibe. You know, there's white sheets over all the furniture. There are these bars on all the windows. Everything is dark and dirty and kind of gross. Like there's this haunted house vibe to this place. And they're thinking this must be a Halloween decoration or some sort of prank. You know, a mannequin kind of jammed up into yeah, the chimney. Yeah, maybe yeah, to look yeah. like a robber breaking into your house or something that the owner never took down because clearly the owner stopped taking care of this property and so it kind of makes sense that these decorations would be left out yeah. and so lois and richard are laughing oh at God. this halloween decoration and marguerite she looks at the legs too and also thinks they're just some halloween decoration doesn't think anything of it and so finally they end up leaving and that was it but as i'm sure you all have guessed of course those legs were not mannequin legs those were thomas's legs and in fact, the creepiest part about this is Thomas may have been alive during the house tour. The autopsy showed he actually did not die of asphyxiation, so he didn't suffocate. He died from dehydration, which takes about two days. And this house tour was about two days in. And the day prior to the house tour, a neighbor had been outside and they thought they heard someone yelling inside of the property. But for some reason, you know, the neighbor just didn't do anything about it. And so there's a pretty good chance Thomas was barely alive as they were touring the house. But, you know, by the time the owner came back two days later and smelled that horrible smell, Thomas had passed away. And that smell was the smell of his body decomposing. Also, just to close the loop on this, Damn. it's not clear why the homeowner had that really aggressive security system with the bars on the windows. He just did. It happens. Some people are like that. On the morning of May 26th, 1990, Marlene Warren was at home inside of her beautiful mansion in Florida when she heard a knock on the front door. Marlene was busy and was hoping that her adult son might go answer the door, but when she looked over to the living room where her son was, she saw he was laying down watching TV and didn't even seem to have heard the knock on the door. So Marlene sighed and just walked over to the front door herself and opened it up. And to her surprise, standing on the other side of the door was a person dressed up in a clown costume holding flowers and balloons. Now, Marlene loved nope. clowns, and she had recently celebrated her 40th birthday, so she figured this must be someone's birthday it's gift evil. to her, it's and she was thrilled. Evil. But after the clown handed Marlene the flowers and balloons, there was this loud popping sound inside of Marlene's house, and then Marlene fell to the floor, blood pouring down her face. So that's going to do it. I hope you enjoyed today's stories. If you did, be sure you check out our podcast what called the, the Mr. Ballin Podcast that has hundreds more stories you can listen to what right now. Fuck? And many of those stories are only available on that podcast. They are not on this YouTube channel. So again, that podcast is called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, and it's available on every podcast platform. Okay, until next time, thank you so much. See ya. Wait, don't go anywhere. If you like today's video about places you can't go, well, you're in luck because we have a whole series of them. Click here. Do it. All right. I really enjoyed today's video. I love the three-parter ones. and That was a really fucking good one, bro. Like, I've watched a bunch of them. That was a really, really fucking good one. No lie. All right. I really enjoyed today's video. If y'all enjoyed today's video as much as I did, please go down there, leave a thumbs up. It really does help the channel grow. If you want, while you're down there, go on over and slap that subscribe button, buddy. Become part of the Bill for a Thousand Nation. We do some crazy shit here. If you want to know when that crazy shit happens, ding that bell. It might work for you. It might not. It probably won't. But if it do, if it do, jump in on one of my premieres, go over in the live chat and be like, hey, Bill, you dinged me. You dinged me. Who do you think you are coming in my house and just dinging me like that? Leave a like and dip. That's all you got to do. As always, be good to one another. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Damn, Mr. Ball, that was good, bro. Like, shit, fart.